Good morning you. I'm just waiting for a video to render, which is a response to one of Gary's videos. And I'm old and I can't go out because I'm going on a bike ride today. I can't go out until that's rendered, so I'm just kind of sitting here with nothing to do. So I thought I'd share a little bit of a book I'm reading with you. Oh, that's all right. It's a book called uh, The Electronic Disturbance by uh, Critical Art Ensemble. It's a collectively written book by Critical Art Ensemble. Uh, quite interesting things about it. It was written in 1994, so it's quite old. It predates World Wide Web, although you'll, I'm sure you'll see the connections. And it's produced in a series called Autono Media, and which is a, a really interesting publishing house. It's available online, I think, free this. But I just want to show you one thing before I read the section. This book, produced by Critical Art Ensemble, is anti-copyright, as you can see. I don't know if you can read that. Anti-copyright 19... I'm reading this backwards. Anti-copyright 1994. <laughs> I can't read it. It says, uh, this book may be freely pirated and quoted, which I think is just great. Uh, but the section I want to uh, look at, it's really great. It's really easy to read this book, actually. It's got a... It's poetic in places, but I think it's really nice. But the section I want to look at is this bit here, called Section 6, Fragments on the Problems of Time. There's only a little bit of it I want to read, just while I'm waiting for that to render. I'll read a little bit out, and then I'll tell you what I think it's on about. Sites and methods of resistance have traditionally been defined in terms of space. The goal of most resistant action has been to destabilise a limited physical space on the assumption that power, like the society in which it is housed, is sedentary and confined to a fixed geographical location. So the assumption is that power is, is fixed in certain places. You know, we, we still, even, even to this day, kind of assume that power is owned by people who live in particular buildings, which are, you know, located architecturally and geographically at a certain location in space, you know, like kings live in palaces. So resistance to power, traditionally, has been through the invasion of space, the deep stabilisation of it says of limited physical space. So the you know the peasants' uprising storms the gates of the palace, yeah, or the um, you know or the, the the serfs charge the castle. You know that's that's the traditional way of doing it. And it's and it worked when power was sedentary, when when power was located at particular geographical places and housed in institutions that attached themselves to single individuals who lived in those places. One of the theses of this book is that no, is that power is now nomadic. It moves about. It's no, it's no longer fixed to a particular geographical location, and it barely exists within an individual anymore. And, that when, and when power changes, then means of its resistance have to change as well. There are no palaces to storm anymore. There are no castles for the serfs to take their pitchforks to anymore. So what do you do? Anyway, that's that. However, it goes on, recent technological advances have brought out the need to reassess spatial disturbance as the only productive form of resistance. That's basically what I'm saying. In addition to uh, kind of sociological changes, which have meant that power is no longer located at particular, in particular buildings at particular places, technological advances have done that specifically. The communications technology particularly, but also transport and other kinds of technologies have facilitated the making of power into a nomadic force rather than a fixed force. It's always elsewhere. Wherever you go, power has always moved on somewhere else. Uh, to be sure, the nature of power itself has, funda itself has fundamentally changed, this is what I was saying. No longer intimately tied to state space, it has re-centred itself in the free zone of time. That's pretty tricky, I'm going to just pass over that bit. Power has shed as many of its sedentary attachments as possible, so that where it is located, matters less than the speed of its movement between temporary points of blockage. This is bringing in the time thing in a slightly different way, which is more interesting. So that uh, alongside, so when power is no longer fixed in a particular government building or a corporate headquarters, that you can actually go and visit and see the people and talk to the CEO and talk to the minister and talk to the king or kill them. When it, when it no longer does that, it becomes nomadic. The, the strength of that power is dependent upon how quickly it can move, so it can never pin it down. Uh, I mean, a really simple example of that you might come across yourself, just really stupid, is you know when you try to ring up a corporation to complain about something, like if you try to ring Google and complain, you can never touch the people in power. You're always passed on to someone else. You're always passed on to a different department. You'd always end up talking to someone who's just reading from a script, or someone who's in a completely different continent who's just picked up the phone because they are, they're, uh, you know, at the end of a helpline and, and, and pay 350 an hour, you know, 
power is always elsewhere. You never get to talk to the people because it's too slippery and, and it's nomadic. And the, and the success, the power of a corporation, the power of a government is the extent to which it can move quickly between, between different kind of attack points. It's always somebody else's responsibility. The, the, the goalposts have always changed. The laws have always shifted. It's, uh, and that's speed. Okay, with the emergence of cyber networks, that's kind of dates it to 1994, cyber networks. With the emergence of cyber networks, authoritarian space can be folded and carried to any point on the electronic rhizome. A rhizome is like an underground network of connections like mushrooms or potatoes have. And that's the kind of one of these great symbols, great metaphors for how power information distribution networks operate. It's all kind of underground, it's all connected, there's no central hub to a rhizome. It just spreads out, you know, constantly. And so, as it says there, um, authoritarian space, it's not like this space. It's not like a city with a palace in the middle of it. It's like a rhizome. So power can just be folded up, shifted to somewhere else in the rhizome. Google doesn't need to lift its headquarters from wherever it is now to a new location. All it needs to do is just transfer the files across, employ some people who work there to run the corporation, and you've shifted it. It can just shift across the rhizome. It's not located in geographical space. Uh, the war machine has shifted its. So we're talking about war now. The war machine has shifted its strategy away from the centralised fortress to a decentralised, deterritorial, deterritorialised floating field that has become disembodied. So the war machine here is two kinds of war machine. There's the war machine of the advanced nations like ourselves, who are fighting wars in different countries, but those wars are being fought behind temp terminals in Las Vegas. You know, with people giving orders from way behind the, the, the scene of operations, completely deterritorialized, and responsibility similarly being deterritorialized. Are those people competent? Those people who are firing those missiles from Las Vegas? Are those, are those legitimate targets? Hard to say. The, the power and responsibility for the war machine, for that kind of war machine, has been distributed. But also, um, terrorism, the other, the other kind of dark twin to that war machine, is terrorism in which insurgent forces are, again, have no central command and control structure. There's no building they go to. There's no, there's no general you can look at. They're like the, the Al-Qaeda, which is a whole series, a rhizomatic series of cells interconnected with no headquarters. There's nowhere to go. There's, no, there's nobody to hold responsible. It's always somebody else's job. So um, again, that's the kind of the, the, how the war machine is, is demonstrating this kind of nomadic power. Uh, the ideology which parallels this economic shift has yet to really congeal, so it's economic as well, of course. Economic power is similarly, you know, yes, gold is held in Fort Knox, gold is held in various places, but economic power is nomadic. Economic power shifts around. The real managers of economic power are the people who are constantly shifting figures backwards and forwards between computers in different continents and, and moving around according to the whims of the exchange rate. So economic power is completely nomadic. And as it says there, uh, the ideology which parallels this economic shift has yet to really congeal. The ideology of the sedentary is still dominant. So we still look to our leaders, we still look to Obama and to Merkel and Sarkozy and, and Cameron and these people to, um, as if they were princes who live in palaces and as if they had their hands on the tiller of the, of the, of the nation, of, of the ship of state. But um, in a sense they're just figureheads. They're just figureheads kind of with the, with the, with the uh, the sea of power, the nomadic shifting seas of power just around them and not actually affecting them at all. They have very little control over that. And we haven't really got an ideology for that. The ideology, the politics we still run in are still the politics of the prince and we still go out every four years and vote for who these people are and we still kind of believe in them. There was a really striking moment during the, uh, I think it was the, Egypt, the Egyptian uh, revolution last year now, when, when there was crowds in the streets, you know, classic nomadic take to the street power, decentralized, and the news media are constantly looking for someone to talk to, constantly looking for someone to point a camera at. And when finally, I can't even remember who it was, some minister from, from an opposition party finally arrived on the scene, there was, no, there was no microphone for him to speak at, there was nothing to see, there was nothing for him to say, and yet still the, the cameras of the international news media followed this bald-headed guy going through the crowd as if he was a representative of sedentary power, even though sedentary power was just not there. It's almost a, almost a superstitious longing for it. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, it's entered double. Given this situation, what I've just talked about, one of the key objectives of the resistant cultural worker, people who, I like to think this is myself in a small way, but all of us who are doing this kind of stuff, resistant cultural worker, people who are working in a society, but, but I've got some real misgivings about it, um, is to disturb the solidification of the new ideology. Oh, that's such a hard sentence, sorry about this. Given this situation, one of the key objectives of the resistant cultural worker is to disturb the solidification of the new ideology before it becomes a symbolic order of even greater tyranny than the current one. So what? Um, so one of the challenges that's presenting all of us who are interested in activism and kind of interested in um, new media and interested in, in new kind of social and political formation, one of the challenges that we have to face is to make sure we don't create an ideology, a politics, a politics of this nomadic power, which is actually even worse than the sedentary one. You know, we can kind of see that. I mean, so let me just use Google as an example. I mean, Google, I was watching a video earlier on today, and the way that Google and, and Facebook and all of those media uh, networks work is by kind of customizing all of our experiences. You know, so we're always kind of given what we're looking for. Um, whatever we favorite, whatever we like on YouTube, on all these channels, becomes, uh, becomes part of, you might be interested in this. You know, so we're constantly being presented with things we like. That's a very particular kind of ideological and political choice, isn't it? Uh, uh, and, um, you know, we're, 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 we become kind of tribalized by the, by the corporations, by nomadic power, kind of tribalizes and distributes us in a way which we may not really we'll be entirely comfortable with. Or we should certainly think about it anyway. So there's a, as I said, there's a, there's a challenge there. And just the, just the kind of myth of choice and the myth of lifestyle. You know, the idea that, that, that transnational corporations can deliver our food to us a lot cheaper than the local store. And they can do that because transnational corporations are nomadic. They can shift their workforce to wherever, or they can shift their center of operations to wherever the workforce in the world is cheapest, whichever, whichever small group of individuals are feeling the most oppressed right now and will work for the cheapest wages. So nomadic economic power shifts around. And we like that because we like buying stuff cheap in Walmart and Tesco's and supermarkets. So, um, so we and we support the ideology which allows supermarkets to operate in that way. So, in a sense, we're giving we're giving um, a blessing to a certain kind of ideology fixed in a nomadic understanding of power, which is a problem, which could be a problem. So, how what are we as cultural resistant workers, if that's who we are? Um, what do we do about that? That's a question. All right, so let me just see where to finish off. It's finished rendering now, so I won't be a minute. Uh, given the situation, one well, of the key objects before it comes a symbolic order of even greater tyranny than the current one, and to rechannel the convergence of hardware, that's video, telephone, and computer. Remember, this is written in 1994. Rechannel that convergence into a decentralized form accessible to others besides the power elite. When this was written, uh, it was pretty much Arpa Darpa kind of time when the internet was really universities and military organizations but um, you know and we are in a position mean, yes there has been a and just in terms of the media there has been a great opening out that convergence of hardware as it says video into a video telephone and computer into, into a decentralized form accessible to others that has largely happened but there are definitely forces at work to try to stop that I mean you just see how much it's, um, and it's not just non-western states try to clamp down on the media whenever there's a problem Yes, of course, Twitter and Facebook and all those things closed down in China. But when there was some small riots by dispossessed people in some of the cities in Britain, there were serious discussions about whether to shut down Facebook and Twitter in the UK because people were supposedly organising in this new media. It was bullshit, but that's what people were saying. So, um, so yeah, so what do we as cultural workers do about that? That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Decentralized form available, accessible to others besides the power elite, and just things like SOPA, for example, the the various um, legislation that comes on to try to limit access, not just access to governmental power, but access to corporate power. One of the one of the functions of SOPA, the um, Stop Online Piracy Act, is to clamp down on users being able to access resources and being able to use this media in a, in a truly divergent and distributed way uh, and it'll be a huge problem if it comes through okay before this nearly impossible task can be attempted cultural workers that's you and me 
must step back and use time rather than space as a frame for analysing the priorities of resistance. Dun, da, 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 I have no idea where it goes after that. I'll let you know.